If you'd like to turn then to Romans chapter 5, uh, chapter 5, chapter 9. Uh, we're going to be looking particularly at uh, chapter 10, but Romans 9 um, as, as well. Last time um, I was um, speaking on, on a Sunday, we saw uh, all about Paul's emotion, Paul's great emotion, his deep sorrow, his unceasing anguish for his people, the beginning of chapter 9. Tonight, we see Paul's emotion again. Chapter 10, verse 1, my brothers, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. My heart's desire is that the Israelites may be saved. Paul was passionate about saving people, passionate about the gospel, preaching the gospel, and particularly passionate about his people, the Jews, that they might be saved. His heart's desire and prayer to God was that they may be saved. Now why? would Paul pray for the salvation of the Jewish people? After all, didn't they have their own religion already? Didn't they have God's law? Didn't they have synagogues to go to? Why would Paul feel the need to convert them to another religion? Was he trying to win some intellectual battle between Christianity and Judaism? Was Paul on an ego trip? How big can I create this church to be, this growing church? What can I do? Why was he so emotionally involved? My heart's desire and prayer to God is that they may be saved. Why so much emotion? Well, Paul tells us, at the end of chapter 9, he tells us, what shall we say? That the, that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, the righteousness that is by faith. But the people of Israel, who pursued the law as the way of righteousness, have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. Righteousness is right standing before God. Righteousness is being acceptable to God, acceptance by God. And the contrast that Paul is drawing here is between those who seek acceptance by God through their own works, through their own righteousness, through their own efforts, and those who simply believe. The contrast is, in, is between those in verse 30 who obtain it by faith in those, and those in verse 31 who pursue the law as the way of righteousness but fail to attain it. The contrast between those in verse 30 who attain it and those in verse 31 who did not. And that is why Paul is so emotionally Involved because his people, the Jewish people, have not attained the righteousness that they, that they were so desperate to achieve. Because despite all their religion, <clears throat> despite all their learning, despite all their law keeping, despite all their attendance at the synagogue, they had missed it. Despite all their effort, they had missed it because they tried to achieve righteousness by the things that they did. What they should have done instead was to turn to God in faith and receive the righteousness that was offered to them in Jesus. They should have trusted in God to make them right. And Paul describes this paradox of trying your very best but failing and simply believing and receiving, he describes this paradox as a stumbling stone. Chapter 9, verse 
32, the people of Israel, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Paul describes it as a stumbling stone. Why? Why a stumbling stone? Because it's a paradox. It doesn't seem to make sense, does it? Why doesn't going to the synagogue count? Why doesn't trying to obey the law count? Why doesn't saying my prayers count? In short, why doesn't what I do make a difference? Well, that's what we're going to find out tonight. And it's important that we find out because the stumbling stone that the people of Israel stumbled over still exists today. Because although Paul was talking about Israelites and Gentiles in chapter 9, it still applies to us today. It's the same. The same difference between works and faith. The same difference between trying to attain God and receiving God. The same difference between works, working out your righteousness, and faith, simply receiving it. And so we've got three points this evening. First of all, dead religion. Secondly, living faith. And thirdly, a saving call. Three points. So first of all, dead religion. Dead religion. Let's look at dead religion. Paul says in chapter 10 and verse 2, he says, I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. There is nothing wrong with being zealous for God as long as it's heading in the right direction. Nothing wrong with being zealous as long as you're doing the right thing, as long as your zeal is pointing in the right direction. In verse 3 tells us that the Israelites were not. Since they did not know the righteousness of God, and sought to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to God's righteousness. The people of Israel thought that through their own works, through their own righteousness, a man or woman could obtain favour with God. They could achieve it. They wanted to establish their own righteousness. Chapter 9, verse 31, the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness did not attain their goal. Dead religion. The law was given to the people of Israel after they were called. Abraham was called by God, and then years later Moses was given the law. So the law was given to people who had already been called. God had already said, I loved you. God had already said, you are my people, long before the law was given. So the law was given for the people's protection. It was given for their blessing. It was to show them how to live. This is how you please God. But very quickly it became corrupted. Very quickly it became misunderstood. And very soon the people of Israel saw it as a way to be saved. Not as a way to respond to the fact that they had been saved, but as a way to be saved, as a way to earn God's favour. And so it was not surprising that they were zealous to be obedient. They thought salvation lay that way. They thought their salvation depended on it. But their zeal was pointing in completely the wrong direction. It wasn't based on knowledge. The law was never meant to be a way of salvation. And so in desperately trying to be obedient, they were actually being disobedient. Because they didn't know the God they were trying to be obedient to. They were zealous for a God that they didn't know. And the result was that their obedience actually had no merit at all. They were trying to climb a ladder to God but didn't realise that they'd laid it against the wrong wall. It was completely in the wrong direction. And theirs were dead works. It was dead religion. 
Now, this isn't just a first century mistake. It's not even a, just a Jewish mistake. Because men and women always, always have sought to reach God through their own works. They've sought to win favour with God by doing what they thought was right. It's been the same throughout the whole of human history. It's the nature of religion. You commit to a belief. And in following it, you believe you will be pleasing God, whatever that work might be. Whether it's praying or fasting or giving or going on pilgrimages or blowing yourself up. You think, if I do this, God will be pleased with me. Whatever you call your, your God, if I do this, I'll be saved. It's true even for religious Christianity, for the Christian religion, in inverted commas. Because many think that going to church will save them. Being a good person will save them. Saying their prayers will save them. God will be pleased by these things and it will go well with us and heaven will be ours if we keep on going. But what Paul is saying here is that this is dead religion. Dead works. It doesn't get us anywhere because just like the Israelites it is not according to knowledge. Verse 2, I can testify about them that they are zealous for God. No doubt, no doubt they're zealous. But their zeal is not based on knowledge. Their ladder is against the wrong wall. They're going in the wrong direction. It's not according to knowledge. Instead, says Paul, we need God's righteousness. Verse 3, since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. And so it is that Paul is so emotional about his people, the Israelites. They are trying their best. They are zealous. Zealous for God. But they're going in the wrong direction. That is why his heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Because at the moment, they're not. They're not saved. Now that might be true of some of us here this evening. If the Bible is cold to us, just a book, if we don't believe God will speak to us through it, if our prayers are just routine and there is no genuine faith, no genuine belief that God is, will actually hear or, or, or answer our prayers, if going to church is all about ritual or meeting people and not about meeting God, then that is dead works. That's dead religion. And we can all fall into that trap. All of us. Because we like doing what we do, don't we? It is nice to come to church and meet with people. And it's nice to have the, night, the routine of a hymn sandwich. It's nice. And so quickly we can get caught up in the routine because it feels comfortable, it feels secure, and it becomes dead religion because we're not actually meeting with God. Well, if that is us, what do we do? What do we do? Well, this is our second point. Instead of having a righteousness of our own, of our own we have to trust in God's righteousness. And that righteousness, righteousness is not achieved, it is received. It's not achieved, it's received. It's given by God and it comes by faith. Living. Faith. So our second point then is living. Faith. The contrast between trying to do it all ourselves, dead religion, and trusting that God has done it. Living. Faith. And Paul tells us very clearly what living faith is. Verse 9, he says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. That's living faith. To declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. The basic confession of the Christian faith is Jesus is Lord. The foundational doctrine, foundational belief is that Christ is raised from the dead. We are saved by what God has done, sending his son, raising him from the dead. So let's look at those two things very briefly. First of all, saving faith is a declaration. It's a declaration. Verse 9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Well, Paul isn't just saying if you say it. If you say Jesus is Lord, you're saved. Like if you say abracadabra, the magic works. No, it's not just a statement. It's, it's faith. It is a submission. It is a declaration that I am serving Jesus Christ as my Lord. Last week, uh, the MPs had to, to swear an oath of allegiance to King Charles. They declared, he is our king, we are serving him. That's what they did. Well, to declare Jesus is Lord is to swear allegiance to Christ. Jesus is my Lord. I am his servant. The word for Lord that Paul uses here is the word kyrios. Kyrios. It's the word that was used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament for the word Jehovah, the name of God. Jehovah, Yahweh, I am. So Paul is saying here that Jesus is God. And if Jesus is God, then we need to follow him as Lord. If King Charles came in here this evening, we would swear allegiance to him, wouldn't we? He is our king. If Jesus Christ was here this evening, we would do the same, wouldn't we? And more so, because he is Lord. He is sovereign and Lord over us. So first of all, saving faith is to declare Jesus is Lord. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. He is my Lord. I serve him. Secondly, saving faith is belief. Second half of verse 9. If we believe in your heart, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you believe with your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. Interesting, but Paul doesn't say, if you believe with your mind, if you understand it with your mind, he says, no, if you believe with your heart, if you believe with your heart. Paul was writing in the first century, not the 21st century. If we say, I believe in my heart, something, we tend to mean something kind of quite vague, don't we? A bit of a dream, a bit of a hope. I believe in my heart that this is true even though all the evidence is to the contrary. I believe it to be true in my heart. But when Paul was writing, the heart meant so much more. The heart meant the will. The heart meant the intellect. The heart meant emotion and motivation and will. To believe with our heart had implication for the way you live. To believe with your heart had consequences. It meant action, decision. When election time comes, it's not enough to understand what the parties stand for. You have to put it into action, don't you? You have to exercise that understanding and you have to vote. And in the same way, Paul is saying to believe with your heart requires action. It requires decision and commitment. Now, what is it that Paul is saying we must believe with our heart? He's saying you must believe that Jesus was raised from the dead with your heart. That Christ not only lived, but lives, lives. And this is where these two requirements come together. Jesus is Lord. He was raised 
from the dead. This is where these two requirements for saving faith come together because the resurrection proves that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is God, Jesus is Kyrios. And so to be a Christian, to be a Christian, you must believe with your heart, that means your intellect and will, that Jesus didn't just live, but lives, and is now raised from the dead, and that he is Lord. That's what being a Christian is. Because we believe in the resurrection, we follow Jesus Christ as Lord. He is Lord over us. Because how can you submit to a dead person? How can you submit to someone who is no longer with us? You might follow their teaching, but you can't put your trust in a dead person, can you? The World Cup is at the end of this year. Can you imagine Gareth Southgate at the press conference announcing his England team? Goalkeepers. In defence, we have so-and-so and so-and-so, and Maguire and Stones and Bobby Moore. And people will go, he was a great player, but he's dead. You know, you can't put your trust in Bobby Moore, great player that he was. No. How can you put your trust in someone who is dead? Well, Paul is saying that Jesus isn't dead. You have to believe in your heart that he is raised from the dead. And because he is raised from the dead, he is Lord. And so he's alive as Lord to hear our prayers and answer our prayers, to teach us from the Bible. He is as living as you and me. And he is as with us and together with us as you and me and as we are together through the Holy Spirit. He is alive. The resurrection and the lordship of Jesus Christ is fundamental, central to the Christian faith. And to be a Christian, you have to submit to Jesus as Lord. And to do that, you have to believe in the physical, historical resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And if we do this, says Paul, we will be saved. Verse 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Living faith. So, dead religion. Righteousness cannot be achieved by trying to please God. <coughs> living faith. If you want to be saved, you need a living faith in the risen Lord Jesus. So what do we do with all of that? What do we do with it? What is the application? Well, the answer is in chapter 10, verse 11, to 13. Paul's answer is this, from verse 11. As scripture says, anyone who puts their trust, sorry, everyone, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all, on, all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So our third point is a saving call. A saving call. What is the application? A saving call. Paul applies verses 1 to 10 of chapter 10 in verses 11, 12, and 13. And it's, it's, it's a pretty straightforward application. And it is that God is making an offer of, of salvation to all of us. God is offering salvation to everyone, anyone in verse 11, all in verse 12, everyone in verse 13. God is making an offer of salvation to us all, and we just have to call. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. It doesn't matter who you are. Everyone. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your race is, what your colour is, 
whether you're male or female, boy, girl, what your status is, it doesn't matter. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It was true for Paul, the Pharisee, steeped in the Jewish law, steeped in the religion, just as it was true for the thief on the cross, who knew nothing except in those final hours of his life when he calls on Jesus to remember him. But they both call, and they are both saved. doesn't matter whether you're Peter or Thomas. Peter, um, extrovert, exuberant, outspoken, over-promising, under-delivering, always putting his foot in it. Or Thomas, anxious, cautious, tick box. I'm not going to believe until I put my hands in his side. Both of them saved. Why? Because both of them called on the name of the Lord. In Philippi, in Acts, three people, slave girl, demon possessed, completely under control of the devil. Lydia, prosperous businesswoman. Philippian jailer, ex-Roman soldier, hard-bitten, cynical. All of them saved. Why? Because they called on the name of the Lord. Salvation is deliverance from the wrath of God against our sin. And the Jews were trying to achieve that salvation through their own righteousness, through doing what they thought was best through their religious works. Paul says, no, no. Turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus. Call on the name of of the Lord. Call on him. Believe what God has said and call on the name of the Lord and you are saved. It's a saving call. Some here this evening might be wondering where they stand. Might be wondering where they stand. Maybe thinking perhaps I've been trying to win God's approval through what I do. Through going to church. Through praying, through trying to be a good person. And all this talk of Christ as Lord, well, this is all very new. And I've never really thought about the resurrection as having any kind of meaning at all on me today. Nice thing to think about at Easter, but its impact on me today? I don't know. Perhaps never really considered why the resurrection is so important. Well, here is the application that Paul would make to you. Verse 11, the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So what is the, the application to you? It is to call on the name of the Lord. To call on him. To submit to Jesus. As your, as your Lord and as your Saviour. And not to think, but I've done so much in the past, I'll have to start all over again trying to please God. No, you won't. That's the point. That's the point. That ladder was leant against the wrong wall. You just call. You just call. And you are saved. Don't think it is too late for me to change. It is not. Just call on him like the thief on the cross did. Hours to live hours before he died on the cross. Just call. We don't achieve righteousness. We receive it. And this call is for believers too. In verse 11, Paul quotes from Isaiah 28, verse 16. Verse 11, the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. In fact, Paul is re-quoting it. Because he quotes it in chapter 9, verse 32, as well. But his point is that anyone who believes in Jesus will be saved. Believes. Nothing about works. Nothing about religion. So if you are a Christian, do not let your obedience to God get in the way. Don't let your obedience to Jesus become a thing of duty. Come to church because you want to meet with God. 
pray to God because you want to speak with him. Read the Bible because you want to hear from God. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, not everyone who impresses God with their attendance and their prayers and their Bible knowledge. We don't achieve righteousness, we receive it. Whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, we don't achieve it, we receive it. So we've seen dead religion, living faith, a saving cause. Paul has been drawing the contrast between dead religion and living faith and how we simply need to call on the Lord. And as we conclude, let's do so by looking very briefly at verse 6, 7 and 8. Because verse 6, 7 and 8 are very confusing, aren't they? Verse 6, the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. What is that all about? Bringing Christ down or bringing Christ up from the dead. What does it mean? Well, what Paul is doing is summarising his whole argument, really. He's saying faith is not hard. It's not difficult. He quotes from Deuteronomy, which we read earlier. And taking out the bits in brackets, this is what Deuteronomy re how Deuteronomy reads for in, in Deuteronomy 30. Taking out the bits in brackets, uh, beginning in verse 5. The person who does these, sorry, verse 6, the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven or who will descend into the deep. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That's what Moses declares, that knowing God, that loving God is not hard. He is near. We don't have to go up to heaven. We don't have to go down to the deep. He is near. So now if we insert what Paul says in brackets about bringing Christ down, what he means is that we don't have to try to get to heaven. Christ has already come. God has sent him. And if we insert the bit in brackets about not descending uh, to, to bring Christ up from the dead, what he's saying is that we don't have to descend into the grave. Why? Because God has brought Christ up already. God has raised Christ from the dead already. It's not our effort that brings Christ down. It's not our effort that raises him from the dead. God has done it already. We just believe. God has sent him. God has raised him. We just need to believe. And so it is that, that zeal, the things that we think will please God, do not. Even if we pursue them zealously, religiously, we might fast, we might give, we might go to church, we might go through any number of rituals, thinking they will please God, but they do not. Instead, Jesus demands that we start again, that we call him Lord, because he has done all the hard work. He has come down. He has done. He has been raised from the dead. Believe in him, says Paul. Believe in him and you will not be put to shame. Call on him and he will bless you. Why? Because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved.